Let us not forget that the cross of Jesus Christ is a radical display of love. It's a radical display of God's undeserved kindness in the face of injustice, which, by the way, is exactly what our passage is about today. Would you take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 6? Luke chapter 6 is a, a passage of Scripture. It's the Sermon on the Mount. We continue in this great teaching of Jesus the Christ uh, as he teaches uh, his people about what it looks like to be a follower. Uh, are you a follower of Christ? Have you called upon him as Lord? Have you repented of sin and looked to him for salvation? Well, Jesus says this then is how you should live. New Hope, let me tell you this at the, uh, on the forefront of the message. The principles laid out in Luke chapter 6 are impossible to follow in the strength of your own flesh. The words that will be shared today about responding to injustice with a radical display of undeserved kindness is desperately in need of the Holy Spirit to, to obey this. So let me tell you this from the onset. Uh, obeying Luke chapter 6 was for me one of the most difficult things I ever chose to do. But that decision to obey Luke 6 is a decision that has reaped the biggest blessings that my life has ever seen. I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later, just in a very small frame. But just know that the principles laid out here have transformed my life, and frankly, it has made this ministry possible for me. Luke chapter 6. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Let me tell you about uh, a man named Tappan. I have not met Tappan, uh, but two friends of mine from America have. In over 20 years, they have journeyed with Tappan, and they related their story uh, about Tappan to me this week. And so I commend it to you as being fully verified based on eyewitness events. 20 years ago, Tappan and his wife and their five-year-old son lived in a small village in India. They were practicing Hindus. Uh, his wife had epilepsy, debilitating epilepsy, and they tried everything in the Hindu faith to seek resolution. They went to the Hindu gods, they went to the Hindu temples, they sought medical doctors, they, they even tried witchcraft. None of that worked. Until finally one day, a church planter came into the village proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, and he, play, and he prayed for his wife, uh, Tappan's wife, in the name of Jesus, and she was healed. It was that moment that Tappan recognized that there is only one true living God and his son, Jesus the Christ. Tappan said this regarding that moment 20 years ago. He said, we knew it was Jesus who had done this. We were sinners, so we repented of our sin and we followed him. We studied the Bible and we started a church in our home. That was back in 2004. Well, in those early years of clinging to Christ and following the road of discipleship, it was met with increased opposition and adversity and hostility by family members and friends who were deeply devoted to the Hindu faith. And they experienced great adversity and even threats of death. And yet, in the midst of that, Tappan continued to go around evangelizing uh, different villages and proclaiming Jesus. And on one of those days, as he was out witnessing for the sake of Jesus and his wife was home, uh, distributing materials in the marketplace, he got word that there was trouble at home. So Tappan got on the train, he went back home to his village only to find the deepest levels of injustice that cut him to the heart. His home had been destroyed, completely leveled to the ground. His wife had been murdered. And their five-year-old son had been kidnapped and taken hostage. Who were the perpetrators of this evil? Well, believe it or not, it was their own family members who did this. Their own family members destroyed the home, their own family members killed his wife, and their own family members abducted the son. And I don't know about you, but in the midst of that moment, there would be a lot of emotions going on in my heart about what I am called to, what I should do. But in that moment, Tappan cried out to the Lord. Here's what Tappan said at that juncture of life. He says, I cried out to God to help me. Why did my wife have to die? but I could not forsake my Lord because he promised never to forsake me. This was the moment. It was the pivot point of his life. When in the face of radical injustice, 
Tappan had the resolve, the deep emotional, spiritual resolve birthed by the Holy Spirit that he would, no matter what injustice had just taken place, that he was gonna remain faithful on the road to discipleship and he would not forsake his Lord. Why? Because his Lord had not forsaken him. New Hope, we're gonna get into the, into the nitty gritty today of levels of injustice. And across this uh, sanctuary and our friends in the online community, listen, there are many injustices that each one of us face. Some of us may face unjust social media accusations. Some of us may face uh, the injustice within a neighborhood with a certain person. Some of us may have injustice within the workplace because of coworkers or this or that. And some of us may have injustice perpetrated by family members against us where we feel that we have been unjustly or unfairly treated. My friends, the instruction of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is an introduction to our hearts. This is the way of Jesus. This is the pathway of those who ascribe to him as, as king of glory. This is what it looks like to be a disciple. And New Hope, the bad news, it is impossible to obey in your own strength. The good news, when it is birth of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus gives you strength and ability to obey that which he calls you to do. So here is the sermon in a sentence as we consider levels of injustice. Nothing puts flesh on the bones of the Christian faith more than responding to injustice with undeserved kindness. Nothing puts flesh on the bones of the Christian faith more than responding to injustice with undeserved kindness. And that decision of Tappan, that he would not forsake his Lord because his Lord had not forsaken him, became the pivot point to what would occur later as God began to bless and reward and strengthen him in the face of radical injustice. What happened in Tappan's story is remarkable. Would you like to know what happened? Yeah, good, me too. You're gonna have to wait around for that. But that is just the beginning of the work. It, the very beginning of God's redemption story happened because there was a man of God who took Luke 6 very seriously and he decided that he was going to respond to injustice with a radical display of undeserved kindness. And what God did is nothing short of a miracle. Let's go to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 27. And uh, here is the first point, injustice will come knocking. Injustice will come knocking. My friends, it will visit you. You will have moments of unfairness in life. You will have those moments in life where somebody will do something and it will cut you to the core. It will take away something. Uh, it will leave you feeling robbed. It will feel you leaving cheated. There will be moments of life that you will be filled with anger, bitterness, revenge, and hatred. And listen, we're not talking about just people out there. It could be people even that are the closest to you. It could be a sibling. It could be a family member. It could be a coworker that you see every single day that even though you see them, you're grating within your heart. Injustice will come knocking. Well, here it is. Jesus, in the midst of the injustice, he has a response that he urges. Here's the response Christ urges. Let's jump right in. Sermon on the Mount. One of the greatest sermons ever preached. Here it is. But I say to you who hear. Are you listening? Yeah. Scripture says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And here is Christ on that flat plateau saying, but to you who are listening, hear this. Well, here's his instruction when injustice comes knocking. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Any questions? Well, that's easy to do. The response Christ urges is completely countercultural. People in the world do not do this. People in the world are unable to do this because it is only available to those who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. When injustice comes knocking, and you will have that happen, you will have an enemy that will come against you with unfairness or injustice or insult. You will have these moments in life. Christ says this is the way of discipleship. You follow me as Lord, you call upon me as Lord, the way of discipleship looks like this. You love those who hurt you. You bless those who persecute you. You pray for those who insult you. That's the way of Jesus the Christ. 
And right there in the first century, as Jesus issues that, you could imagine the quizzical looks on people's faces like, oh, hold on, but well, what if, and what if this happens, and what if, well, Jesus knows what you're thinking. And he knew what, he knew what they were thinking. And so right away, as he gives the response, he goes into these, okay, well, let me show you just how serious I am about this truth. When he raises three different potential objections and the three different scenarios that he raises are, well, what about insult? What about uh, injustice? What about injury? Take a look with me. When he says this, verse 29, if one strikes you on the cheek, what does Jesus say? Turn the other also. It, it, it's a metaphor. If somebody insults you, instead of battling with great resistance against them, you take the way of meekness. And New Hope, let me just tell you, the way of meekness is not a way of weakness. Amen. If someone insults you, slaps you upon the cheek, turn the other also. Second objection. If one takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. You have insult, you have injustice. Somebody has taken something from you that does not belong to them. Jesus says the way of discipleship is that we respond to injustice with a radical display of undeserved kindness. Third objection, he says this, give to everyone who begs of you and if one takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Okay, New Hope, listen. Here are three different scenarios in which Jesus is saying a certain level of unfairness or injustice has occurred. And in the face of that, he says, we are to be those who respond with radical displays of undeserved kindness. And it's there that he gives then verse 31, which has been known by some as the golden rule. And what does he say? Do unto others as you would have them what? Do unto you. Now, some have also said that this is the most misinterpreted verse in the Bible. Perhaps it is. Because people often will just say this in the world to serve some of their own self-appointed ends. But look at the context, my friend. The context is this. Injustice comes knocking and Christ is giving us the response. Here's the response he urges. Love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who hurt you. This is all birthed out of this desire of Jesus to invite you to walk in the path of discipleship so that when injustice comes knocking, that we are ready to respond with undeserved kindness. Now, it reminds me of this little key thought as I was uh, uh, thinking through this, because uh, uh, like you, I have feelings uh, when injustice comes my way or unfairness comes my way, I have all of these emotions come up in, in my heart of things that I want to do towards that person. Do you have those emotions? So here is a key thought as we think about the response Christ urges. No response better displays our love of Jesus than blessing from the heart someone we'd rather punch in the face just as honest as I can say it. Amen. There is no other response in life shows that you are seriously in love with Jesus than those, than those critical moments of life when you feel unfairly treated, you feel injustice against a, by a neighbor, you feel unfairness in the workplace, nothing showcases your love of Jesus better than when you decide to bless them from the heart when you would just rather punch them in the face. And justice will come knocking. The response Christ urges, what is it? Well, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's the response Christ urges. Now let's move to the rationale. The rationale that's given is this. New Hope, listen. The rationale is you're different. Are you a follower of Jesus? You're different. That's the rationale. You're not like people of the world. And so Jesus anticipate. So, okay, well, why should we do this? Take a look with me at verse 32. Here's the rationale. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that for even what? Even sinners do that. Verse 34, and if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. New Hope, let me simplify this for, for us to understand. The response Christ urges, love your enemies, 
is undergirded by this rationale. You're different than the world. We live in a world system where it's, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. And the analogies that he's given, if you do this, if you love those who love you, if you lend to those with, you know, that's what people in the world do. That's the type of thing that people in the world do. Let me illustrate. If you mow your neighbor's yard because your neighbor mows your yard, big fat deal. <laughs> Jesus says even sinners do that. If you fill in for a coworker at work because that coworker has always filled in for you, Jesus says, no credit. Even sinners do that. If you help somebody move houses because that person is going to help you move houses, Jesus says, big deal, no credit. Now, back when you were in school, some of you are still there. Uh, did you ever take a test and then you got it back from the teacher and on the top it just said zero? Like no credit. That's happened before to some of us. Jesus is saying, listen, that's really good that you would do that, but zero credit, even sinners do that. Here it is, let me summarize again. The response Christ urges, love your enemies, is undergirded by the rationale, New Hope. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're different. You're different from the world. You are different from the world system. You are a follower of King Jesus. And ultimately, here's the reason it matters. Take a look with me at verse 35. The reason it matters is ultimately because of a re reward that is to come and a father that we have to imitate. Take a look at verse 35. But love your enemies. You see that? Yeah? yeah. He comes back to the main point. Response, he urges, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Rationale, you're different from the world. Now let me tell you the reason why this all matters. He comes back to the main point. Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And new hope, your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. And in case you wonder what type of character the Most High God has, notice for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Praise Jesus for that. Amen. He's kind to the ungrateful. He's kind to the evil. And so Jesus says, be merciful then, even as your father is merciful. New Hope, let me tell you something about these two things. The reason why this matters is because we live in a world system that deeply needs to see the presence of the living Christ in their midst. They need to see the character of the Father in their midst. And the way that the world is going to see the character of the Father is through sons of the Most High or daughters of the Most High who are living out these principles on a regular basis and nothing puts flesh on the bones of the Christian faith more than responding to injustice with a radical display of undeserved kindness. And the reason it matters is twofold, because your reward is great and you have a father to imitate. Think about these for a moment. The Lord Jesus promises great reward for those who obey him in this. He promises, listen, if you are facing injustice and you keep your eyes fixed upon a savior, obeying him, enduring unfairness, praying for those who persecute you, enduring injustice with an eye upon the savior, Jesus promises you're gonna be greatly rewarded. Now, back when I was a kid here in Traverse City, one of my favorite uh, restaurants to go to, especially on my birthday, uh, was La Senorita on Garfield. Uh, some of you used to go there, kings and queens and princes too. We want to show our best to you, All right? Okay. But the reason why I really liked La Senorita was not the food. It was the treasure chest. <laughs> some of you who were there, every time you would leave, they had a treasure chest. It was open and it had loads of trinkets and trash. But as a kid, you're like, I get to pick out anything from the treasure chest. Now listen, as trinky and trashy as that was, there is a treasure chest in heaven. And Jesus Christ himself promises, if you bear up under injustice by loving your enemies, by showing undeserved kindness to those who have committed deep injustice, if you do that with an eye upon your Savior, you have to trust his character. He will bless you. He will reward you. And don't forget your mission in life. It's to display the character of our father. 
He is kind to the ungrateful. He is kind to the evil, which by the way, ought to fill all of us with a surge of praise because isn't it true that at one moment in life, perhaps for 10 years of your life or 20, some of you for 30 or 40 or 50 years when you were walking in darkness, isn't it true that you were living with ungratefulness? You were living with evil. You were walking your own path. And what does the scripture say? It says, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So every time we gather, especially at the Easter season, we are reminded that we are celebrating lavish, undeserved kindness from a Savior who loved us in spite of the deepest injustice. And now, my friends, we have the privilege. We are sons and daughters of the Most High to showcase that love to the world. Injustice will come knocking. The response Christ urges, love your enemies. The rationale, you're different. The reason it matters, we are showcasing the love of the Father in the midst of a dark world. Action step. Cool your jets. When injustice happens, what do you feel? Well, frankly, anger, bitterness, resentment, revenge, and all of those complicated emotions that something has been unfairly done to you. Listen to this principle. Those who claim Jesus as Lord are to respond to injustice like Jesus is Lord. Cool your jets. Well, let me tell you, just testify for uh, maybe two minutes. I had an enemy in my life. This is shared with his permission today. For three years, uh, we, we just didn't get along. We saw each other a lot. We just didn't get along. And it all reached ahead in 2006, 2007, when I felt that there was an injustice done, perceived injustice done to me. And my friends, I was angry. I was bitter. I wanted revenge. And over the course of months, God used his word to soften my heart and to change me. And finally, there came a day when I began to walk in the path of freedom. And I and I, and really, truly was revolutionized by Luke 6 to be like, you know what? If I claim Jesus as Lord, I'm going to begin to act like Jesus as Lord, and I'm going to take him at his word. And so there came a moment in 2007 when I decided I was going to show kindness to something that I perceived as injustice. And so I decided to invite this enemy over for dinner. We were having Jets pizza. That's why I said, cool your Jets. <laughs> we're having Jets pizza. I didn't think he would come, but he came. I didn't want him to come, but I invited him. <laughs> but he came. And he joined me and my wife and my children at the dinner table, and we shared Jets pizza. My friend, listen, that one decision was a pivot point of the relationship. That one decision was a decision that would then lead on to redeeming that relationship and not just redeeming it, but restoring it. And wouldn't you know, as the years unfolded, that one man who was at one time was an enemy who I considered to be uh, one that did not deserve kindness, and yet Jesus changed my heart. God began to redeem and restore all the way to the point where that man is now my best friend. We travel together. We run together. We do everything together. Listen, hold on, hold on. And he leads worship here at New Hope every Sunday. <laughs> Pastor Rick shared with his permission. But let me tell you, it goes all the way back to a moment in time when there was somebody so close in life that you see every single day and you begin to implement the truth of Luke chapter 6. That we are called to love those that we would rather not love. New hope, God is in the restoring business. Amen. Let's move on. Injustice will come knocking, but Jesus offers a path to freedom. Take a look at verse 37 and 38, okay? Let's, let's kind of catch up. If you fall asleep, okay, now's a good time to wake up. Jesus has said, this is a response I'm urging. Love your enemies. The rationale, New Hope, you're different. You're different from the world. The reason it matters is you got a great reward coming and we have a father to imitate to the world. He's merciful, so we ought to be merciful, right? Yeah. Question, how do we do that? How do we walk on that path of freedom? 
because I believe that when Christ actually invites us on a path like this, it is for our own good. Think about that. He's actually commanding something that's for your good. Even though you don't want to do it, understandable, I get that. But listen, he's inviting you to the pathway of discipleship for reasons that will benefit you in the long run, as well as bring glory to the Father. So how do you do that? What I love about verse 37 and 38 is it's a pathway of freedom. And I picture it like this. You are here. You are fuming mad about something that happened. Anger, bitterness, resentment, rage, malice, everything within you says towards that person or perceived injustice, I hope they rot in hell. That's the emotion. And I'm telling you, if you haven't been there, you will be there. If you are there, you know what I'm talking about. You have everything within you that you're angry. Well, Christ offers this roadmap to freedom. And it's a roadmap that there's three signposts that say, okay, Here's the steps in the process. You want to live a life of freedom? You want to live a life that is, that is uh, uh, unrestrained by the bitterness and the resentment within your heart? Well, here's the path. And Jesus offers us three unique signposts. Signpost number one. Step number one is you got a mindset to change. New Hope, it all starts right here in your mind. It starts with the way that you view that enemy. It's a change of mindset. Take a look with me at verse 37. Verse 37 says this, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. New Hope, let's start with the mindset. The mindset when you have injustice happen to you, the mindset says this, that an unfairness or an injustice has been committed against me, therefore I have the right to sit as judge over them. And when you gain that mindset or when you have that mindset that that person owes me, that person must pay me, that person must return, you sit in a place of judgment and condemnation over that person, and my friend, that will only lead to a life of bondage. You gotta change the mindset. And the mindset change is this, there is one judge and I am not him. It takes very seriously these words, judge not lest you be judged, condemn not lest you be condemned. It frees us to walk on the path of freedom because we all of a sudden are at a place in life where we relinquish the control of payback and we allow God to have the vengeance. What does the scripture say? Old Testament and New Testament. Do not repay evil for evil. For vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Just a little side thought. Do you really think that God will repay better than you? Yeah, he does. God has the ability to repay far better than we ever could. And so we take this seriously. We change our mindset. I am no longer the judge. I am stepping back. I relinquish that role to the Lord Jesus, who alone is the judge of the living and the dead. We have a mindset change. And we move along the progression from hostility, at least to neutrality. And eventually we move to active generosity, but hold on for a moment. We're at that moment of how do you move from hostility to at least a neutrality? It begins with a change of mindset. We recognize today that sitting in these seats and also in our online community, layers and levels of injustice of various degrees are represented as chance would have it. The Lord uh, introduced me to a couple from New Hope last week. And they said, hey, could we come talk to you? I had never met them before. This is also shared with their permission. They came in on Monday, and they shared the deep pain. Their son was murdered three years ago. And here's a couple in northern Michigan, members of New Hope Community Church, who come every week, and they live every single day under the cloud of darkness. Why? Because something was taken that can never be replaced. How, how do you repay that? How do you, and so every single day, is, you could understand the, the, the ebbs and flows of the emotions, the revenge, the hatred, the bitterness, the, all of that stuff, and yet we're Christians. And there in my office, there was these flickers of grace when the dad would lean over 
And with tears in his eyes, the dad from New Hope would simply say this. He says, I have to let God deal with him. I have to let God deal with him. That is the murderer who is right now sitting in prison and eligible for parole in 20 years. How would you feel about that, church? The pain that that creates. Listen, if you are experiencing the tumultuous nature of injustice, you are not alone. Recognize that sitting around us are people who have various degrees of that. And the first step on the roadmap of freedom, the mindset to change, and the mindset is you got to let God deal with them. You have to let God deal with them. And that will move you from hostility to neutrality, at least. Let's move on. Second roadmap on the map to freedom is this. You got a debt to release. New Hope, warning, it gets harder. It gets harder. Here it is. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. The way of Jesus is not always easy. You want to walk in the road of freedom? You experience injustice? Step one, you got a mindset to change. Step two, you have a debt to release. Forgiveness. Think about this for a moment. We love to hold on to that bitterness and resentment because we begin to allow that person, that that injustice to define us. And all of a sudden in life, the injustice, the person which should never have controlled our past now begins to control our future as well. And Jesus calls us to this radical act of forgiveness. What is it not? Well, forgiveness is not pretending like it didn't happen. Forgiveness is not as if, I'll just sweep it under the rug, it doesn't really matter. No, listen, an injustice has been done. A wrong has been committed. And forgiveness doesn't just pretend like, oh, everything's gonna be okay. Forgiveness actually simply releases that debt between you and the Lord, and it releases that debt to say, I am no longer gonna live in a position as if I am the judge or the condemner of that person. I'm gonna change my mindset. God, you are the judge, and now I'm gonna walk in the pathway of freedom. I'm gonna walk in forgiveness. I'm going to release that debt to the Lord, trusting that he is the one who will be the one to repay, not me. And why this is so critical, my friend, is for this purpose, is because depending on what was taken from you, depending on what level of injustice, depending upon the unfairness, listen, that very thing in life may never be able to be repaid back to you. In fact, some of you have enemies who are not even alive anymore, right? Right? And there's no ability for them to repay. And so the critical nature is Christ is calling us to walk on a roadmap of freedom. He's calling us, this is the way of freedom. Walk in it. And step one is change the mindset. Step two, release the debt. Release the debt. Take a look at this slide here. Next one, grace to extend. The grace to extend, new hope it gets harder. He wants us to move from hostility to neutrality, but then listen, to active generosity. Notice with me. Give and it shall be given to you. New Hope, the context is how you respond to injustice. How do we respond? Judge not, change your mindset. Forgive, release the debt. Step three, what? Do good to them? Yep. And notice the reward that comes with it. Give. Do good. Give, and it shall be given what? To you. And how much will the Lord indeed bless you for obeying him in this? Take a look at it. It says this. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. It's a word picture. It's imagery. And, and if I could be, uh, so uh, just to kind of give a picture, uh, this is how many fries I want in the Culver's bag, man. I mean, I want that thing like pressed down, shaken, settled, overflowing. This is how much bacon I want on my burger at McGee's, okay? This is how much lobster I want in the lobster bisque, man. Don't chintz me. I want plentiful. I just pour it in, right? Okay, this is what Christ is saying. 
When you walk the pathway of freedom, you change the mindset, you release the debt, and then you move into this act of generosity where you actually do good to those that you would rather punch in the face. Christ says, listen, my eyes are on you. Your reward will be great. And I will pour upon you blessing upon blessing upon blessing. The Lord has a way to reward his faithful people. Action step. Take one step. Take one step. Take a step with an enemy that will move you from open hostility to neutrality to active generosity. New Hope, I don't know where you're at in the process. I don't need to know all the details. But this call to discipleship is a call to do something. It is a call, wherever you are at in the process, to move along the pathway. What we recognize is this, is that when injustice comes knocking, Christ urges a response. The response, love your enemies. The rationale, you're different. The reason it matters, we have a father to imitate in this world. Craig, how do I do that? You do it one step at a time. And somehow, some way, birthed by the Holy Spirit, the Lord enables you to move in your mindset from, I hope they rot in hell, to, okay, I've forgiven them, but I certainly don't want anything good to happen to them, to, Lord, I'm going to pour out blessing, and I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. This is what Tappan did in India. For two years, he didn't see his son. He stayed in the village on the outskirts. Tappan began to share Christ in the face of adversity. Under threats of his own life being taken, he remained faithful to Jesus. He would not forsake the one who did not forsake him. And in two years' time, the Spirit of God began to open doors in this community, in this village. After two years, the family members who had killed his wife allowed him to move back into the village so he could finally see his son. Let that resonate. For two years, he didn't see his son. And finally, they allow him permission to see his son. And then the village gave him permission to officially establish a church plant in the village. Listen to this. Listen to what Tappan says. Tappan says this. He says, I read in the word that Jesus forgave his killers, so I forgave them. And I waited for them to kill me too. I would see to my house needs every morning and then teach the Bible every afternoon. I began to teach others. I began other churches in other villages and I discipled the leaders of those churches in the word of God. My friends, this is a story of a man who made a decision that he was gonna change his mindset. I am not the judge. He was gonna forgive his enemies, releasing the debt. And he was gonna seek active generosity teaching, instructing the word of the Lord, inviting people to salvation. New Hope, let's contextualize this now because we are not Hindus in India. What does this look like? I was blessed this week to read various things, but one thing I read from, a, uh, from a Pastor Begg, Alistair Begg in the Cleveland area, he said uh, these words. I think it's very appropriate. He said, I do not know what obeying Jesus' command here needs to look like for you in your specific circumstances, but I do know it needs to look like something, something tangible, something practical. New hope, the response Christ surges, love your enemies. The rationale, are you a follower of Jesus? Yeah, yeah, some, some, some of you are. Well, the rationale is you're different. And the reason it matters, it represents our father well. He's merciful to the ungrateful. He's merciful to the evil. And therefore, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Craig, how do we do that? Take one step at a time. You move from hostility to neutrality to active generosity. You change your mindset. You release the debt. And finally, you extend grace. Okay, as you go along that pathway of discipleship, New Hope, let's take caution. Let's proceed with caution. Here it is, proceeding with caution. Uh, I love Jesus for a whole bunch of reasons, but this is one. Uh, He makes very complex truths very simple to understand. Uh, So let's proceed with caution. Uh, Here's uh, three things to keep in mind as you move on this pathway of freedom. Here they are. Proceed with caution. The first one we're going to say is this. Not all advice is good. Right? Okay. 
You have injustice done to you, what do you do? You run to other people who have also had injustice and you pour out your heart, this person did this and this is unfair, and what does that person do? Oh, that's terrible, you need to get them back, you need to pay them back, you need to do this. Not all advice is good. Be careful where you get advice. Take a look at this, verse 39. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? I mean, that's kind of, it's, it's fun, right? It's a fun parable to think about. I mean, just picture it, picture it. There goes a blind man and he's leading a blind man and where are they going? They don't know. He says this, will they not both fall into a pit? I think the whole idea here is this, my friend, not all advice is good. And you gotta be very careful when you experience unfairness or injustice. If it happens in the workplace and friendship, be very careful who you go to because you may be going to get advice from another person who has been blinded by injustice and they're gonna give you things that really satisfy your own flesh of how you can get back. You gotta be very careful. Not at all advice is good advice. The second caution is this. Remember your training. Are you a follower of Jesus? Well, listen, you're in training. You're in training to become like somebody. Who? Oh, I wonder. Take a look. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, if you want to write your name in the Bible, this would be a good place to do it. You could just say, Craig is not above Jesus. Scott is not above Jesus, right? Rick is not above Jesus. I mean, think about it. You are not above Jesus. And so the thing that Jesus is calling us to is to be fully trained so that we are like him. Okay, think about this for a moment. Our master, savior, Lord, Jesus has walked a path and he's inviting us to follow him. The question becomes, how did our savior handle injustice? Well, this is a great verse for you. First Peter chapter two, write it down, write it down, write it down. Go ahead, write it down. I'll tell you what it says, 1 Peter 2. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. That verse got me through 2007, my friends. To recognize that when Christ was reviled, mocked, insulted, persecuted, and crucified, Christ Jesus, though he had all authority in heaven and earth, did not revile in return. What does Christ do? He entrusted his soul to the Father who judges justly. New Hope, you're not above your teacher. But when you are fully trained, you will become like him. This is what I love about Jesus. He's inviting us to do that which he has already done. Praise God for that. That he is merciful. So we are merciful. He does not revile in return, so we don't revile in return. We respond to injustice with a radical display of undeserved forgiveness, undeserved kindness. So take caution. Not all advice is good. Remember your training. And probably most significantly, look in the mirror. New Hope, do other people have issues? Oh, yeah. Do other people have things in their life, lack of character? Yep. Look in the mirror first. Some of you are very familiar with this passage, but I hope it, I hope it, it surfaces a little bit more understanding to recognize it's in the context of you experiencing personal injustice. Take a look with me. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me... Let me take out that speck that is in your eye. When you yourself do not see the log that is in your eye, you hypocrite. Praise Jesus for just straight talk, right? (laughs) You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly and take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. New Hope, this reminder is in the context of injustice, unfairness happening against you. And when Christ, when, when, when that happens, Christ is saying, listen, not all advice is good. Remember your training. 
and look in the mirror first. God will deal with other people, but listen, for you, look in the mirror. What is it that God is doing in your heart? What is it that he's wanting to, to transform? What is it that he's wanting to purify? What is it that he's wanting to cleanse? And when you begin to move on that roadmap of, uh, roadmap of freedom, from hostility to neutrality to active generosity, when you begin to submit your life and respond to enemies with a gracious disposition of radical kindness, then the Lord will begin to redeem and restore and reward as he has promised. So this is what Tappan did. And New Hope, based on eyewitness testimony of two friends of mine in America who have journeyed with Tappan for 20 years, I assure you that this is true. That in the course of years, because of Tappan, because of that ministry, because of his posture, I'm not gonna forsake him who has not forsaken me, because of his decision to forgive, because of that decision, the Lord began to bless Tappan and his ministry. He began to train dozens of church planters who listened, who planted a verified 200 house churches in those villages around there, which led to 3,000 believers gathering weekly in the praise of Jesus. But perhaps most significant is that Tappan lived to see the day that he baptized those family members who killed his wife. Wow. Tappan says this, Tappan says this. He says, I miss my wife, but I know I will see her one day in heaven. I have joy now because my mother worshiped the goddess Kali, but now she worships Jesus. I baptized her and 20 family members with my own hands, some of whom were my wife's killers. I praise the Lord, but I still have much work to do bringing the love of Christ to my people. Now on that day, Several years ago, when he was baptizing people, including those who had killed his wife, my friend from America was there. He was witnessing that moment. And as John was, in his mind, he was pick, he was, it was Luke 6 on display. Luke 6 was being carried out. And he was seeing the fruition of all of these decisions, the, the moving along the road from hostility to neutrality to active generosity. And now he's baptizing those who killed his wife. John on the phone this week, when I talked to John, he, he said these words. He says, outside of my marriage and the birth of my kids, it was the most powerful moment of my life. As I watched Tappan baptize his wife's murderers, I was thinking, there is no way I could do that but it made me consider what it looks like to truly follow Jesus. This is a passage, Luke 6, that is not just for Tappan. It's for New Hope. It's not just for John. It's for New Hope. It's not just for some uh, Middle Eastern context or Hindu context. It is for Northern Michigan context. In whatever situation you are facing, it is a call to do something. I don't know the details. I don't know everything that has occurred, but what we do know, here it is, injustice will come knocking. The response Christ urges, let's recap. The response he urges, love your enemies. The rationale given, you're different. The reason it matters, we are here to showcase the merciful Savior. He's merciful, therefore we are merciful. How do we do that? You change your mindset. I am no longer the judge. God is the judge. I forgive and release the debt. Why? Because I'm not going to allow my future to be controlled by someone who should have never controlled my past. And then we move to active generosity, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing, and we leave it all in the hands of the Lord who is faithful to his word. Your reward is great. That's the pathway of Jesus. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Would you bow your head? Our friends from the worship team, come on up. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord, for the radical display of undeserved kindness that was displayed upon the cross. Thank you, Father, that even while we were hostile in our minds, enemies of the cross of Christ, thank you that you displayed what it looks like, that you demonstrated love, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we are committed to this path of discipleship, but it's not easy, admittedly so. So we invite your Holy Spirit to help us. Father, you have given us a command here that we cannot do in the flesh. So my prayer, Lord, for myself, my prayer for this church is that we would be 
full of the Holy Spirit, anointed to carry out your works. Thank you, Father, for your mercy. Thank you that you were kind to somebody like me who in the course of life has been ungrateful and evil. Thank you, Lord, that you are merciful. And now may we showcase that love to the world, the world of sinners who desperately needs to see a people that are devoted to the truth of Jesus Christ. Help us to walk in freedom today. I pray this all in the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, my friends who are worshiping with us today in the online community. It is always a joy to have you with us. Uh, Though I cannot see you, (laughs) I love you. And I extend a warm, hearty greeting from my heart to yours. May the Lord richly bless you today. Well, that's all for today, my friend. I'm Craig Truether, your pastor, reminding you, you are loved.